All right, I think we have mostly everyone. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and for participating and being interested in this. Um, we're going to get started shortly here, but just a quick intro. My name is Yola Shubielski, and I'm the director of public information at the department. Um, in just a few minutes, as I mentioned, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Logue, who's our director of plant industry. He's going to provide some background on spotted lanternfly, including where we are today with the invasive and some of our next steps here at the department. So after that, the plan is to open it up to questions. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to give this a shot is if you guys can raise, uh, raise your hand, use that feature down at the bottom of your screen for those that are on their desktops. And if you have any questions, we'll call on you then. Um, you can also use the chat feature and we'll try to get through all of your questions that way. Also want to make a note that we'll be recording this in its entirety and we'll post it on our YouTube channel later at the end of the afternoon, likely, and we can always email that back out to those that are interested as well in having that recording um, if you're not able to do so yourself. Otherwise, I think that's it for most of the housekeeping. Um, if I forgot anything, Hannah can jump in and remind me, but otherwise, I think we're ready to get started. So, Chris, go on ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Yola. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Chris Logue. I'm the director with the Division of Plant Industry here at New York State Agriculture and Markets. Uh, appreciate all of you joining us today to learn a little bit more about uh, spotted lanternfly and, and some of our uh, efforts here in, in New York dealing with this invasive species. I'll just start out with a little bit of background for you uh, about spotted lanternfly. It's an invasive plant hopper uh, from Asia. Uh, it was first discovered in the United States in Pennsylvania uh, in 2014, and it very likely was present uh, in that location for a period of time before it was, was discovered. Um, that is not something that is uncommon in the world of invasive species. Um, at low levels, a lot of these different invasive species are uh, difficult to detect. So, in the subsequent uh, years, uh, it's since been found in uh, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, West Virginia, Virginia, um, most recently this year in North Carolina, uh, Indiana, and Iowa. Uh, we found it in New York State uh, in 2020 on Staten Island, and we have subsequently seen it in a number of other places throughout the state, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. A little bit more on background uh, on spotted lanternfly. Um, it does feed on over 70 different plant species, and it's feeding uh, because, it, because it is a plant hopper. It has a piercing sucking mouth part. It basically feeds on plant sap. And that's Im important from the standpoint of the type of damage that it does. Um, direct feeding damage, uh, which in particular has been seen uh, on grapes is really a large concern for us. But then there's also secondary damage. The uh, spotted lantern fly, like other insects in the same group, uh, creates uh, honeydew, which falls down on the plant material uh, that it's feeding upon, and you also get uh, growing on that honeydew, which is a sugary substance, uh, um, sooty mold, which actually can reduce photosynthesis. So those are our, our two main concerns with it. Um, and again, uh, as we've seen with a number of different uh, states reporting this, this issue, as well as how we've seen it in a number of locations around New York State, um, Spotted lanternfly is pretty good at getting around and getting from place to place. Two main ways that that happens um, in the adult stage, and we just are starting to see the adults uh, in New York over the last couple of weeks. In the southern areas, uh, probably the end of July, we were seeing them. Upstate cooler areas, uh, you know, continue to see them changing from the late instar uh, immature into adults. So, in the adult stage, uh, it can hitchhike on vehicles um, as well as other types of goods and move from place to place. But also, you can have a uh, long distance transport uh, in the egg stage. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the piercing sucking mouth part, the feeding can really cause stress on plants. And in particular, in Pennsylvania, it's been documented to cause some problems in particular 
uh, in grapes and in particular in vineyards uh, that were newly planted. Other crops that it may have an issue uh, with and, and potentially cause problems on uh, hops, uh, maple, uh, apples, any type of fruit crop. Uh, those are all things that we're concerned about, in particular from the secondary damage where you see honeydew uh, and um, uh, sooty mold, which reduces photosynthesis and can actually uh, predispose the plants to feeding from other insects or from uh, being more susceptible to, to other plant diseases. We're really concerned, in particular in New York, about the economic impact. Um, the total economic impact of all invasive species in the U.S. exceeds $70 billion per year. And here in New York, uh, our wine industry is estimated to have a value of about, or our grape and wine industry, I should say, has an estimated value uh, in the area of $300 million. And then finally, the other thing that we see in some of the uh, more heavily um, populated areas is that large populations of spotted lanternfly can make it unpleasant for folks to be outside and uh, either working in their yards, relaxing in their yards, or, or so on. So a little bit about what we've been doing here in New York State. Uh, since 2017, uh, we've been uh, working on spotted lanternfly actively with a number of different agencies, uh, including Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, Department of Transportation, Thruway Authority, um, to monitor for spotted lanternfly. This is a many hands make, make lighter labor. Uh, all those agencies that I've mentioned have helped us with uh, spotted lanternfly trapping and also with uh, reporting instances of spotted lanternfly around the state. Um, we've been conducting surveys of higher risk areas across the state uh, since 2017. And in fact, uh, going back into 2015 and 16, we were also looking uh, carefully for spotted lanternfly around the state. We've also done a lot of inspections of uh, nursery stock, stone shipments. Uh, we did have some trace, trace information early on uh, from our uh, counterparts in Pennsylvania. Initially, uh, although we never know 100% surety uh, how an invasive species uh, got into the country, we do think it was introduced into Pennsylvania on uh, stone. Uh, related to or used for uh, building projects. And so we did uh, do a lot of trace work and monitoring of uh, stone shipments that came into New York and uh, subsequently did not find anything related to those. Currently, uh, spotted lanternfly in New York, uh, pretty well established in uh, the New York City area. Um, we have uh, areas in the Hudson Valley that also have spotted lanternfly established, uh, Binghamton area, uh, and most recently uh, we've been surveying in the Syracuse area, although that uh, preliminary work there really appears as though the numbers are pretty small up in the Syracuse area right now. Continue to be doing a lot of uh, comprehensive education and outreach, uh, trying to work with uh, the trucking and the rail industry uh, to get us uh, raise awareness so that those industries are taking all of the necessary precautions uh, to minimize movement. Um, and again, continue to work with our USDA partners and our other state departments of agriculture uh, to monitor this and to make sure that there's good communication so that we all know uh, what's going on in the different states. So we're really, we're really thankful to uh, Pennsylvania in particular, our neighbor to the south, who has done a really good job uh, at containing this over the past several years. Um, but despite all of these efforts, as I mentioned before, we do have a number of places in New York where it's where it is established. Also, we wanted to uh, thank all of our residents around uh, uh, New York who have reported spotted lantern fly to us. We do have a reporting tool on our website where folks can go in. They can put down, uh, put in their uh, 
their information, uh, upload a picture, it uh, loads into our survey system. It does allow us um, to parcel out those sightings and prioritize them for further inspection and survey. I would say for New York City, uh, we do know that it's present in New York City. We continue to get a lot of reports out of New York City, um, and we would ask that uh, those reports be uh, minimized a little bit because we do want to prioritize uh, being able to follow up on reports uh, from upstate and in particular areas around our grape growing regions, which are very important for us uh, to uh, actively protect at this time. So if you're upstate or Long Island, we really do uh, urge you to report this to us so that we can uh, follow up on it with, with survey. Um, if you can collect a specimen in particular upstate, uh, you can either put it in the freezer, put it into some hand sanitizer uh, and uh, keep that. Also, a pitcher is good. And just a couple of action items here for you. Um, because we are uh, in the midst of the adult flight season, it's very, very important uh, that, that folks who are traveling and we know as we get towards fall, people like to travel uh, either out east onto Long Island, onto the wine growing regions or the vegetable growing regions in, in Long Island or upstate uh, into the Hudson Valley or Finger Lakes regions. Uh, inspect your vehicles. Be sure that you don't have adult spotted lanternfly um, hitchhiking with you uh, on your vehicles. Uh, that's really important for folks who are living in infested areas. We want to minimize the spread as best as we can. And then uh, later into the fall, as we see egg laying, um, you also want to be looking at uh, any sorts of conveyances or, or goods that have been uh, idle. So um, RVs, boat trailers, or any types of goods that you might be uh, shipping that could have egg masses on them. Um, very, very important. I can't stress that checking, uh, checking for adults and for egg masses enough. And we do really appreciate uh, any help that the public can give us with, um, you know, with reports, uh, with management on their own property. We have really good partners at Cornell Cooperative Extension and the New York State IPM program who can assist you with recommendations on how to manage this pest on your own properties. And again, uh, other things that folks can do to help us out uh, in addition to reporting, uh, egg scraping, um, which when you do the math actually does make a difference in, in populations going forward. And, um, you know, this is something that as we deal with it, it's gonna take uh, multiple measures uh, to minimize the growth of this and the increase in the population. And so with that, Yola, I think I've done my introduction. Excellent, great, thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, we do have a few folks who have already sent us in a question via chat. So let me just see if I can pull those up. And give me one second here. So we have a question from Brendan. It, his first question is, how far east on Long Island has spotted lanternfly been found? Yes, uh, so along in the area of uh, MacArthur Airport on Long Island, so a little bit into Suffolk County, uh, reports in Nassau a little bit heavier, uh, but in particular, um, I think the furthest east we've been is uh, is that MacArthur Airport area. Thank you. And if you have a follow up, Brendan, feel free to shout. Uh, Gwen looks like she's asking, how many reports have we received of spotted lanternfly in New York City and how does that compare to last year? So I don't have numbers right now. I know last year we were up over several thousand and I think we probably have continued those numbers this year. Um, so, yeah, the report numbers are certainly increasing. We anticipate they will continue to increase as the adults emerge. The adults are quite a bit easier to see. Uh, so folks, you know, may have missed the uh, immature stages. And uh, so we'll probably see higher numbers of reports. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, 
Gino looks like, uh, let's see here. Are there any thoughts on the potential economic impact of spotted lanternfly back in 2019? Pennsylvania estimated 325 million if the infestations continued. Yeah, as I mentioned, I mean, our main concern on economic impact is is the wine and grape industry in New York that, you know, we are number three in grape production. Um, you know, that does not obviously include some of the numbers that Pennsylvania looked at in that study back in 2019, which I think included some of their uh, recreational industries and things, things of that nature. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Annalise is asking, is there a possibility of a spotted lanternfly in quarantine like nearby state New Jersey has been doing within their counties? Yeah, good question. So we've had an exterior quarantine for a number of years. Uh, we do have an interior quarantine um, that's been drafted. Uh, we're looking at what our survey information looks like coming out of uh, out of this 2022 season. Also looking at um, there's a national effort that's going to be starting here in the next uh, couple of weeks to uh, evaluate spotted lanternfly and do some uh, strategic planning about what's working and what's not working. And we're going to kind of see what that process looks like and then make our decision as far as interior quarantines are concerned. Great. Uh, Dave McKinley's asking, are there preferred pesticides to deal with spotted lanternfly? And if so, what are they? Yeah, so spotted lanternfly from a pesticide standpoint is it's a fairly delicate insect and it is fairly easy to control with insecticides. Uh, what I would recommend for specific recommendations is to uh, refer to your Cornell Cooperative Extension or New York State IPM program. I know uh, New York State IPM in particular has pretty robust resources on their website. Uh, I hesitate to make a specific recommendation um, because there are some uh, regional differences and, and uh, certainly some differences as far as uh, what your goals are uh, for your property. But, but those, that information is readily available through Cornell. And I can certainly uh, send that link to Cornell's IPM website that has some really great information on all that to this entire group that uh, RSVP to our uh, media availability as well, and that might be helpful. Uh, the next question comes from Marla Diamond, and she's asking, can you tell us your level of concern? So, yeah, I mean, we've been concerned about spotted lanternfly uh, from, from day one uh, when Pennsylvania discovered it. Um, we've worked really, really closely with, with Pennsylvania, uh, as well as the other states on this. Um, we're always concerned about invasive species. This one is you know, particularly challenging because it does move in in many different ways, um, and also, you know, it is it is very visible, and um, in areas where there's high populations, the general public uh, does get very concerned about it. You know, our main our main focus here at uh, Department of Agriculture and Markets is is the agricultural impacts, and not that we we discount or um, discount the uh, impacts on the general population, but we are very focused in on, on the grape industry uh, and how we go about protecting that. And Sarah uh, Holthouse from the Post Journal is asking, how far west in the state has spotted lanternfly been found further than Syracuse? And she indicates she's from a newspaper in Western New York, which again is the Post Journal. Sure. So good question. So um, we did have reports earlier on in the summer, probably about three, four weeks ago, if memory serves, uh, of a report out in the far western part of uh, New York, out in the uh, Buffalo area. We did investigate that. We think that particular one uh, was probably a hitchhiker from last year. Um, these do, you know, stick around. We're not. Uh, we were not able to detect a population in far western New York uh, when we went out there and did some intensive survey. Not to say that it isn't there. We were not able to detect it uh, when we went out and looked into that report from a month or so ago. And Michael Miller's asking, how likely is it to spread into the Adirondack region and the North Country? Can people do anything if they spot it? 
So that's an excellent question. And so um, one of the things that, that has been um, really great about the response to spotted lanternfly here in the Northeast as well as nationally is some of the research efforts. And so uh, scientists at Temple University, Cornell, as well as uh, USDA Ag Research Service have been working really hard to develop uh, you know, statistical models that, that, you know, try to direct our survey a little bit better, but also try to predict where spotted lanternfly will establish. And current information really indicates that in some of the colder areas of New York, um, it probably uh, will not establish long term. Um, there are parts of New York where you will probably get low enough temperatures, you know, one out of three years to knock the population back. So we are anticipating that we're going to see some seasonal or some geographic differences, if you will, um, with spotted lanternfly in northern parts of New York. But again, um, you know, uh, this is a natural system. We have to continue to monitor it. Um, and certainly reports out of northern New York, we would be uh, particularly interested in. One of the other things uh, that's really important to note on spotted lanternfly, in addition to its, uh, its feeding on grapes, it does also feed on uh, tree of heaven or Alanthus, which is an invasive tree actually. And the tree of heaven's range uh, in New York um, does not get, get up into the uh, colder parts of the Adirondacks. Uh, we don't see it up in that part of the uh, country that much. Uh, that's not to say that lanternfly couldn't be up there. But again, anything in the North Country would be something uh, that we would be very interested in knowing about sooner than later. And so anything you can do to spread the word to your viewers or readers in that part of the state is uh, really important. Chris, can you run through one more time what folks should do if they, they do think they see it in terms of up in that area? I know we talked about New York City doesn't need to report, but again, if you're upstate, what folks should do? Yeah, upstate, you want to take a picture. Uh, you want to go onto our website and access the reporting tool. You can do that. I believe there's a QR code that you can that you can scan on some of our uh, materials about spotted lanternfly. Enter in the location and the picture and that uh, that'll get fed into our survey system so that one of the inspectors or surveyors can can follow up on it. Great. Uh, Maggie is asking is central New York seeing high reported numbers or is it more of a growing issue? So central New York numbers uh, reporting numbers are pretty low. As I said, um, we do have a report did have a report of actually was not a report out of the Syracuse area. That was, I believe, one of our survey crew um, that saw it in, in uh, the Syracuse area. And again, um, we've been surveying up there for probably a week or 10 days pretty intensively. It appears to be isolated. And again, that would be another location where reporting would be very important to us. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, I'm not saying this incorrectly, but Chris, yeah, it looks like going into the fall months, what can we expect to see in Western New York? So, yeah, I mean, in, in Western New York, as I mentioned before, uh, we did have a report uh, of an adult uh, about a month ago that turned out to be uh, an adult that we think was a uh, hitchhiker from from last year. Uh, we surveyed intensively, did not find any uh, any nymphs out in Western New York or immature uh, spotted lanternfly. And again, um, you know, our hope is is that that was an isolated incidence and that we don't have uh, a population there. But again, um, early notifications really important. So if uh, someone sees something, we certainly would would want that to get reported. Thank you. Marla is asking, what can people do if they have them on their property? Yeah, so a couple different things that, that can be done uh, on your own property is uh, you can you can go to Cornell Cooperative Extension or the Cornell IPM program and uh, see what types of control options are available for you as far as uh, an insecticide or pesticide is concerned. Uh, you could look at doing egg scraping uh, later in the fall. 
Um, and again, you do have a window, you know, here, uh, the end of the summer where uh, control either by uh, applying an insecticide or by vacuuming up the adults and, you know, disposing of them, you can, you can pour them into or put the adults into soapy water uh, to kill them. Um, if you do that ahead of egg laying, egg laying doesn't happen until sometime in, in September. Uh, that will help to reduce your populations. If you don't get on the adults ahead of egg laying, then uh, egg scraping is an option. Uh, as well. So just uh, be vigilant. And again, you know, this is sort of a, a multi pronged approach that that folks are going to have to take. Um, the other thing that I would say is, is, you know, working cooperatively with your neighbors uh, is going to be more effective than uh, trying to just maintain your own property. These uh, spotted lanternfly, they do tend to move around from from place to place. Uh, and so. Um, shouldn't be expecting, you know, either one application or, uh, you know, one uh, session of vacuuming adults to uh, control the problem. It's going to be sort of an ongoing thing for a, for a property owner. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Whiteman is asking, are there any indications of potential impact to maple species in forest environments? He says, I field many questions from maple producers and there's considerable concern from that industry. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. We've we've had a lot of uh, conversations with our forest health colleagues at New York State DEC, uh, as well as some of the uh, forest health people at USDA Forest Service and Pennsylvania uh, uh, Department of Forestry. We don't really see, um, you know, huge forest health impacts. Uh, what we actually learned here at a meeting that I attended last week was that spotted lanternfly does tend to be uh, what we call sort of an edge species. So it is going to live in the areas where you're transitioning from farm to field or from, I should say, from farm or field to forest. And so um, even in Pennsylvania in heavily forested settings, um, in particular, uh, you know, commercial or production type forests, we don't see big impacts of, of spotted lanternfly. So with the information we have right now, we really don't think that we're going to see, uh, you know, huge issues with the forest uh, products industry or with maple in particular. But again, um, you know, research is changing almost daily on this. Um, you know, one point that I always try to make when talking about spotted lanternfly is that in 2014, when it was discovered, um, there was not a lot of research information out there about the impacts of spotted lanternfly. A lot of what was available to us was actually um, information coming out of South Korea where it had been introduced, we think from Vietnam or or somewhere else in, in Asia. And so, um, you know, there's just not been huge amounts of information, um, but we're making progress on the research side of things every day. Brendan is asking, will any agency remove tree of heaven if it's reported on public right of ways? So that again is a very, very good question. Um, we did some limited removals of tree of heaven uh, and some other trees in one particular area in New York uh, when we found some egg masses. That was a very isolated, uh, we thought an isolated um, uh, start of an infestation in that particular area. Uh, we think we had an impact on the population there. One of the things that is a little bit problem problematic about, uh, spot, about um, tree of heaven removals is you know, the question has been asked, well, what does that do? Does that drive it, uh, spotted lanternfly into a more um, important, if you will, or economically important crop? And we don't necessarily know uh, the answer to that. Also in Pennsylvania, a lot of their um, control uh, program has been based upon using trap trees uh, that are treated with a, a systemic insecticide and so I think um, widespread removal is probably 
not uh, the best option, but it is certainly something to consider. Also, what we find is, is when we do uh, removals of Tree of Heaven, uh, it is a very vigorous tree, and um, you do get a lot of uh, sprouting from the stump, which often uh, needs to be treated so that you don't wind up with a much thicker population of, um, of uh, Tree of Heaven. Great. Uh, Anna Colon is asking, will colder weather be able to keep a level of insect ma management? So again, in the colder parts of New York in the, in the heat maps or the, or the establishment maps are, are pretty detailed and, you know, the, the terrain and the climate in New York is really varied. You have a lot of microclimates. Uh, there are probably cool, colder areas of the state that maybe you'll see uh, a reduction in population. Uh, answered the question a little bit earlier about the Adirondacks, but again, remains to be seen and we have good partners at Cornell as well as other institutions that are helping us with getting a handle on that on that uh, climate and temperature data. Thank you. And Michael Miller has two questions. Um, so the first one is, do you know the impact it can it can have economically on apple orchards? And have there been any confirmed spotted lanternfly sightings yet in New York uh, vineyards? Excuse me, I thought that was going to say apple orchards, but vineyards. So apple orchards is the first one, vineyards is the second. Okay, so in apple orchards, I think the biggest concern uh, that we have is the is the um, is the honeydew and the sooty mold that is formed on the honeydew uh, that potentially reduces photosynthesis and perhaps could have an impact on yield in an orchard. Also, uh, the honeydew uh, can have some have some other uh, compounds in it that can give a little bit of an off taste to fruits and vegetables that that it's been on. Uh, so you could have an issue where uh, the processing and the washing of, of produce is a little bit uh, harder to do with that sooty mold on there. But again, we don't have any evidence of, of issues with direct feeding damage in apple orchards. Uh, with respect to uh, vines in vineyards, we did recently have, uh, have uh, some reports uh, adjacent to a vineyard in the Hudson Valley. And uh, we did some uh, intensive survey in that vineyard uh, and have, have uh, worked with Cornell and the IPM program to make sure uh, that the vineyard is aware and that the vineyard uh, has a good management plan for spotted lanternfly going forward. Thank you. We have a couple questions uh, as I'm looking ahead that are, are very similar. So I'm just going to group them. Hopefully everyone's okay with that. But Marla, Michael, and Gwen are all, all asking similar questions. Uh, seemingly they're from New York, the New York City area because they're related to that. And it's what should folks do if they see a spotted lantern fly, should they kill it? So um, it, another person indicates that uh, New York City officials are, are suggesting that folks kill spotted lantern flies when they see them. So yeah, it looks like everyone's just kind of curious about, again, what's the process or what do, what do they do? If they see spotted lantern fly, so maybe you can go over that for downstate again, Chris, for New York City, and then again for upstate. Yeah, so um, for downstate, as far as if you see one, uh, New York City area, you do want to kill those, and anything anything that you can, you know, that you can kill uh, prior to uh, mating and egg laying is is really uh, going to have a potential benefit on reducing the population. Going forward, I would caution folks to, you know, not uh, go to superhuman effort and do anything uh, dangerous with regard to that. Um, but yeah, that's going to be uh, really important going going forward. Um, anything that you can do as far as um, you know treatment uh, of your own properties, again, you know, taking into account all of the. Uh, safety measures uh, and and things of that nature. Working with with Cornell and the IPM program, um, those are all things that that folks can do. Great, and that's again specific to New York City. You were talking about. Yes, that is correct. 
And then another question that just followed that is that should people who spot the spotted lantern fly for the first time report it to the state database website and that's news 12 Long Island. So maybe just one more time for folks. I know some people were coming in a little bit late. Not everybody joined at the same time. So I know you've sort of said it a couple times, Chris, but maybe again, just do the, you know, distinct for sure. New York City. Here's what you do for upstate. Yep. Here's what you do. Yeah, so so upstate and I would say the eastern parts of Long Island. Yes, we would want that reported to us. New York City and maybe the western parts of Long Island. Uh, that's more of the, uh, the uh, you know, kill it and start thinking about what your management options are for your for your property going forward. But for uh, for upstate and again, eastern parts of Long Island. Yes, we we would want to have that reported to us. Thank you. And again, I can send folks the information. I know I'm going to send along the Cornell IPM link. I can also make sure that you have the GIS reporting tool link as well that you can share. Uh, Anna Colon's also asking, what is the level spread to our adjacent states? So good question. So we have uh, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, both have spotted lanternfly down into uh, Maryland and Virginia. Um, Pennsylvania has uh, not, probably has maybe uh, about 50% of the state uh, under quarantine. And again, when a county is quarantined, it does not necessarily mean that the whole county has spotted lanternfly. It's just that it has been found in a particular county. Um, you've got some isolated populations in um, Massachusetts, also populations in, in uh, the state of Connecticut as well. Uh, New Hampshire has had a number of interceptions on uh, nursery stock, but they do not have um, have a re any reports of uh, established population, and also Vermont does not have reports of an established population at this point in time either. Vermont did have an interception, I believe, uh, about a year ago in uh, Rutland County uh, on some uh, shipments of, of goods uh, that went into a warehouse there. Thank you. Um, this is another Syracuse based one. Uh, are the preliminary, this is Jules Struck. Are the preliminary findings of the Syracuse area reports published online anywhere? How many reports have you received from Syracuse? And again, I know some folks joined a little bit late. So if you don't mind um, going over yep. that again, Chris, that'd be great. Sure. So the Syracuse, actually, Syracuse report, I think, was something that one of our survey crew actually discovered. Um, and I would have to check into numbers of reports out of the Syracuse area. I don't think we have had many if at all again that is something that is um that is very recent we've been up there surveying pretty intensively and um but we can check into the public reports and perhaps you'll can get back with you on that sounds great yeah please send me an email and we can work through that with you uh the next question is from dave mckinley does a spotted lanternfly feed on cannabis uh, there's, a, you know, question. I guess the concern here is uh, with that program becoming legal. There's growers that are going to be participating in in that in coming years. So, looking at it from the agricultural standpoint. So that's a really good question. I don't know that we have any reports of it uh, feeding on uh, feeding on hemp coming out of our hemp program. Uh, it is a general feeder, but again, I I don't know of any reports on on cannabis at this point. And Joe Workmeister is asking, how quickly can a spotted lanternfly inflict noticeable damage if it finds its way to a vineyard? So yeah, so you know, one spotted lanternfly in a vineyard is is not going to inflict heavy damage. It's going to be a situation if you have a, a large population of them in a in a vineyard and a lot of feeding. Um, and so again, I think uh, for vineyard owners. Uh, being vigilant and being on top of uh, treatments is going to be really, really important. Um, the places in Pennsylvania where there was documented damage in vineyards, um, those were actually newly planted, or one of them, I should say, was a newly planted vineyard. And again, when you're just establishing a vineyard or or uh, a crop, you know, the plants are going to be a little bit more susceptible, in particular, to that. Uh, piercing, sucking uh, damage from the uh, lanternfly's mouth parts. 
Great, thank you. Um, going to jump ahead just to one because they're grouped together again. Michael Miller's asking if one is if a, one spotted lanternfly is found, how likely and how long does it take? Does it take it to grow into an established population in the area? And he's also asking if it was found in Vermont. Wouldn't mind just going over that again, Chris. Okay, so yeah, so uh, to our knowledge, not found in Vermont at this time. I there was an interception uh, in. Uh, I believe Rutland County last year on some goods with some might have been some eggs. I don't remember the, the details on that. Um, and as far as timing to really uh, get established and begin to cause damage, it really from you know first introduction is probably a couple of years time before you have the population uh, up to a point where you're going to see a lot of damage. Thank you. And um, Andrew from New Swab Long Island is asking um, concerns, obviously, about the Long Island area, and he's asking, um, should the Long Island winery region be on alert? Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, any grape production should be aware of this, and I know a lot of outreach has happened in all of the uh, uh, wine grape regions in New York. Uh, we've been uh in conversations with the new york wine and grape foundation for a couple of years on this but yeah folks should be certainly be aware of this and watching for it great question from jules uh from the post standard what would a successfully controlled population look like in new york state in terms of economic environmental damage so you know, I think I think it comes down to you know what is your what is your expectation, what is your standard of of control. I think um, you know that's going to be different in different parts of the state, depending upon how advanced the population is. Um, I think uh, what we're looking for is again to try to protect the vineyard industry uh, as research on. Um, on uh, biological controls, um, various uh, pathogens that might have an impact on uh, spotted lanternfly populations and that type of thing to kind of catch up uh, so that we can kind of come to equilibrium uh, with a population that, that uh, is, is maybe not causing damage or, or causing people to be, um, you know, to be concerned about uh, being outside for recreation and such. Thank you. Brendan's asking, this is probably more for myself and for Hannah, he's asking if there's an online share drive where they can uh, get some pictures, some spotted lanternfly images. So Brendan, we can absolutely send you, I think we have, most of our photos are actually credited to Pennsylvania, but we uh, are able to share those with you for sure. So we can email those to you after this call is over. Um, Sarah Holthouse from Post Journal, which is also Syracuse area, is asking, is there, oh, excuse me, from Western New York, I apologize. Is there an egg laying season or how do people know if they're killing it before egg laying? So maybe just go through the stages. Yeah, so um, just recently we had our first reports of adult emergence. So it's going to be in, a, in an immature stage uh, through probably uh, June through uh, late July, early August, and then the adult is going to be there. Uh, the adult is going to uh, feed for a little while here, and then mating is going to happen probably in uh, early part of September, uh, starting in the early part of December, uh, September, and then egg laying potentially goes on uh, through the through the fall months. Really important, and we have some good resources, as does Cornell and the IPM program, about the appearance of, of those egg masses, because they do change uh, from the time when they are laid and as they weather uh, through the fall and the winter months into, into the following year when they hatch. Thanks, Chris. Um, looks like we're coming to an end here shortly. I think it looks like I have just one more. Um, Annalise is asking, do spotted lanternfly present any immediate danger to humans or animals or pets? Do they bite? And what if a pet happens to eat it or et cetera? What, the, what would be the situation there? Yeah, that's an excellent question and, and one that came up early on in the program in Pennsylvania. And um, the spotted lanternfly does not carry any uh, diseases uh, that would impact humans or domestic animals or wild animals for that matter. 
Um, they do have a piercing sucking mouth part, uh, but they are uh, plant feeders. They are not animal feeders. And so you are not going to get, you know, bitten by a spotted lanternfly. Um, there were some concerns uh, in Pennsylvania early on about spotted lanternfly in, uh, in hay, you know, hay bales and things like that. Uh, no issues uh, as far as animal health is concerned. Um, and as far as is known at this point, no issues if, if the dog or the, or the cat consume them. Again, you know, just saying that if the dog or the cat consumes large numbers, they probably will, will have some issues, um, but nothing life-threatening. Okay, great. Um, looks like somebody else also, Hannah kindly shared, it looks like the, the images, a link to images for everyone. So if you want to check the chat, that's in there already. Thank you, Hannah. Appreciate that. And it looks like, uh, Brian has shared some images from New York state IPM. So great. Everyone. Thank you so much for that. Um, and also looks like some video clips. Appreciate that. Thanks for the partnership there. Uh, Anna clone has 1 more question. It looks like do mantises eat them. Yeah, that's a good question. Mantises are a general, a general feeder. Um, I don't know if documentation saying that they, they eat lanternfly, but they may. Excellent. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? I've gone through all the questions that have been chatted to us. I haven't seen anyone as far as I'm aware, unless I'm missing it. So please shout if I am, but, uh, I haven't seen anybody use the raise their hand function. Um, so I'm just going to give it maybe another minute. And in the meantime, Chris, I'm going to maybe just ask like 1. Follow up just as a reiteration of things. I know we talked a lot about what folks can do in terms of reporting. So upstate, we're talking about, you know, if you see it, take a photo, report it on the GIS tool. We talked about New York City not needing. When we say New York City, we mean the five boroughs specifically. And those five boroughs do not need to report necessarily to us because we're aware of the um, establishment there. However, we're asking folks to take steps to make sure that they control the population. And you talked a little bit about how to do that. So thank you. Um, and we pointed to Cornell and whatnot. Um, I just want to reiterate also that you had mentioned, I know briefly about the fact that this is um, coming into the fall, like busy, you know, summertime obviously is a great time to travel as well, but I'm thinking about the fall too. Um, and how, you know, you talked about this as a hitchhiker and maybe you could just briefly talk a little bit about how folks should check bags and things like that as they're traveling and check their car and, and all of those pieces. Yeah, so uh, very important, you know, in particular with the adults uh, being out there flying, check your vehicle. Um, you know, check, uh, you know, wheel wells in the grill, that type of thing. Uh, the area, you know, uh, between the hood and the hood and the windshield where the vents are. Uh, and again, you know, you may find some, some dead spotted lantern fly on the grill or on the radiator, but what, what you're really after is anything that maybe is alive that has, has kind of hunkered down in there and, uh, is not going to get blown off, uh, the vehicle during the trip really, really important. And then later on in the, in the season, in the fall, after egg laying, if you're, if you're camping or, or uh, boating, hunting, whatever, and, and going to be traveling and, and hauling that camper that's been uh, sitting outdoors in a, in a spotted lantern fly positive area, you want to look at that uh, vehicle for egg masses and make sure it's clean before you go. Thank you. In the meantime, Hannah has um, also kindly posted a link to, so everybody can just take a look at the chat there, a link to our website as well. And there's the short link for reporting. So there's some good resources in the chat box for everyone as well. So we've got pictures, video from two sources, um, a link to our website with immediate direct information and uh, the, the short link for the GIS reporting tool, which is excellent. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I don't see any more questions at this point. Um, Certainly, if anyone has any follow up, you can certainly reach out to myself and to Hannah and we can work with you, uh, you know, and get some answers for your to your questions. But I hope this was helpful to everyone. Um, I appreciate Chris's time as well. And we appreciate everybody. Again, being interested in this and helping get the message out about spotted lanternfly um, and what we can do. Um, again, I also want to mention that a recording of this entire um, media availability will be posted on our department's YouTube channel. So you can look for that a little bit later this afternoon if that's helpful for you and your reporting. Um, otherwise, I think we're all set and we can.